We have one last speaker and you are in for a real treat. He came to speak to our admissions staff. I asked him uh, to tell us about physics because that's his background and he surprised me about his philosophy of teaching. His name is Dr. Mike Cabot. He earned his PhD in physics from Virginia Tech, his master's in science in physics from the University of North Carolina, his bachelor of science in physics and astrophysics from the University of Minnesota. So he has a wealth of experience. Over the course of his career, Dr. Kavitz has authored or co-authored a total of 55 journal articles, and his work has appeared in several publications, including the Astrophysical Journal, the Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, and the Journal of High Energy Physics. You might be wondering why we're giving you a physics professor. I guarantee you are in for a real treat. Mike. Thank you, Monica, for the kind introduction. Uh, don't worry, it's not a physics lecture. Um, I really want to start off by welcoming all of you to our campus and by thanking you for, for being here with us. This is a very fun uh, time uh, for all of you. I'm sure you're traveling around, visiting lots of different campuses, and it is a real honor that you've chosen to take some time, uh, come see what our campus is about, and learn what really makes uh, SUNY Old Westbury so special. Um, but for those of you who have a decision to make, you have to kind of chart a course in terms of where you're going to be and what your future is going to look like, this time can feel a little bit daunting, can feel a little bit intimidating. I always compare it to this scene uh, in one of the Matrix movies where Neo kind of sneaks in the Matrix in a back door and he ends up in this hallway and it looks like it goes on forever. And there's got, it has doors on the left and the right, and it just looks so confusing. And if I think back on my time at this stage of life, that's what I felt like. How do I know what direction I want to go in? Um, how do I know what the right choice is going to be? And it's exciting, it's exhilarating, but it can be a little bit overwhelming. What I wish for you and what I encourage you to do is to own this moment. Make this moment your own. Use your best instincts, your experience, your values, your judgment to make good choices that are gonna lead you to long-term happiness. And if you use that philosophy of discernment, you're gonna be able to make a good choice. And I certainly think SUNY Old West Berry could be a good choice for all of you. But just to get to this moment, to get to the point where you get to decide, where you get to pick a door to go through, is an amazing achievement. And I want to say congratulations. I want you to, to enjoy that moment, drink it in, and feel the sense of accomplishment that you get to make that choice at all. So I want to congratulate you, but not just you. I'm sure that your parents, your friends, your family have been there supporting you, cheering you on, helping you to reach this point, and it's an achievement for them as well. So I want to take a moment uh, and just congratulate your parents. I hope you'll take a minute, give them a hug, say thank you, uh, show some appreciation, and I want to get, have everybody, for all of you, parents and students alike, let's have a big round of applause because you reached this moment. I'm a dad, not quite at the stage that Pat's at. I have a five-year-old son, nine-year-old daughter. By the way, my daughter listened to a version of this speech and she's like, Daddy, you can't talk about the movies. Don't talk about the movies in your speech. You're not allowed to do that. Um, and I get, I've got, I'm getting them through elementary school and I feel very proud of that accomplishment. So to the moms and the dads, you did it. Uh, and that is an amazing, amazing moment. Um, parents help a lot. You sacrifice a lot. You get them out of bed, and when they were younger, get them on the bus, help them with their homework, sit up with them at nights when they're sick. Why? That's what I want to ask. What, what is all that sacrifice really for? Of course, it's because they love you, but it's about more than that. All that sacrifice, all that investment is to get you to a moment like this where you can reach up and grab a bright and hopeful future. <laughs> As I'm sure you've heard, I felt really creative when I 
worked our motto into this speech, but apparently everybody did it, so maybe you can all help me out. Has anybody figured out what our motto is? Own your future, that's right. The reason that's our motto is because there is no better place than SUNY Old Westbury to help you unlock all of those doors and to make you prepared to be successful when you get on the other side. If you come to uh, SUNY Old Westbury, we're going to illuminate paths for your life that you haven't even considered. We're gonna empower you with a sense of discernment to be able to know and select what is the right path for you. We're gonna equip you with knowledge and experience and a set of tools that are gonna allow you to be successful as you proceed down that path of life. That's what we specialize in, that's what we're here for. And that's really what makes this place so special and it's where that motto really comes from. So how do we do that? The way that we do that here at SUNY L. Westbury, it, it starts with an educational philosophy. And it's an educational philosophy that puts all of you at the center of this college. I had a great educational experience in my life, but I went to very big schools. And I'll be very honest, I wasn't sure the whole time that I was there that I was really the center. Big alumni centers, big research centers, I wasn't all sure that it was about me. You're never gonna feel that here. At this institution, you are the center of all that we do. We have educational facilities that are built off of what's called an active learning environment philosophy. So they're not kind of like this room. They're not a movie theater style classroom where there's a lot going up here, faculty member is speaking, going on and on, and you're in the back maybe surfing on your phone and you're disconnected from learning. In these kind of environments and in these kind of facilities, you are an active learner. There's student groups working on projects continually as the instructor moves through the space. It's, and there is ample evidence that this kind of active learning environment allows you to be more successful, allows you to learn better, and it goes hand in glove with the kind of student-centered approach that we have at this campus. And when you look around that classroom, you're not gonna see an enormous number of students. You're not gonna be uh, one face in a sea of seats. There, we keep our class sizes small. We have a small student uh, uh, to teacher ratio so that you get your questions answered. You have direct interactions with your faculty members. They know who you are, you know who they are, and you are a presence in that classroom, an active participant. It's a difference. It's a different kind of experience. And that level of engagement doesn't stop at the classroom door. Our faculty members are active researchers in disciplines across the board. Um, we have researchers on this campus that are doing cutting edge research related to data science, cancer research, um, issues related to public health that address the pandemic that we're all still facing. Incredible achievements in the visual arts, and I could go on and on. All of these faculty members are active in their fields, and you have direct access to them, not just to talk to them, not just to sit in their office, but to do research work with them as a full partner. Uh, as you heard earlier, uh, I, I'm an astronomer, uh, and I have a large research team of which I'm very proud. Gabby is on the panel, she's just one of my students, but I am incredibly proud of uh, Gabby, and she's doing a tremendous job, and she has an incredible future in front of her. I wanna tell you a little bit about my research. Uh, I'm an astronomer, as you heard. We use telescopes to peer out into the universe for a particular kind of signal that we don't understand. It's a bright flash of light called a fast radio burst, and it literally can be seen in other galaxies, extragalactic distances, half a universe away. Right now, I have students working through data sets trying to find signals like that. Our students make discoveries. My students make discoveries. My students are co-authors on publications, present at national conferences, and are supported by a grant by, uh, from the National Science Foundation. And this kind of engagement is true across the board with so many of our faculty. There are incredible opportunities for you here. I do wanna say, that might all sound intimidating. I want you to understand that we have students, I have students that come into my group, and that, uh, well, you're gonna hear a story in a minute, but we take people at all levels. I want you to know that this is a place where you're going to be told yes. Even if you uh, have some kind of 
you know, concerns about your background, things that you feel you're not prepared for, we're going to work with you and bring you up to the level that you need to be to be a full and active participant, both in the classroom and in research. But you might ask, why talk about that? Why emphasize that? What does that have to do with you reaching your future, achieving your goals? A lot of you may be thinking about your future and defining your goals in terms of particular aspirations, a particular career path. Maybe you want to be a teacher. Maybe you want to get into medical school. Maybe there's a particular professional program that you want to reach. We're a comprehensive college, and that means something. We have programs in so many disciplines that are able to uh, set you on a path to achieve your career goal regardless of what it is. And how does that relate to that direct access to faculty? How does that relate to direct participation in research? I want you to consider applying to a professional program. We had a lot of people say, you know, and as a lot of students are, interested in medical school. I want you to think about the difference between a recommendation letter, if we consider the whole application process, recommendation letters are crucial. A recommendation letter that comes from a faculty member who doesn't even really know who you are, who at most can look at the transcripts and see what your grade is, but doesn't have any real memory of you, compared to a faculty member who sat with you, who knows you, for whom you were an active member of making that classroom a success, and even better, a faculty member who is your co-author, who is your research mentor, and who can talk about the contributions you made to research and the presentations you made uh, at a national conference. Those interactions matter in terms of allowing you to reach your goals and allowing you to reach your dreams. I want to tell you a story of, uh, from my own personal experience that goes, uh, I think, directly to this issue. I had a student that was recommended to me. I think he was a little skeptical, um, but uh, a fellow faculty member felt that it was a really good match. He came to my office, said he wanted to hear about my research. I said, I'm a physicist, I focus on astronomy. Uh, and he immediately responded, oh, I hate physics. I said, that's okay. You're gonna learn to love it. Um, and he said, what I'm really passionate about are computers and, and, and working with computers and computers and lots of issues related to technology. And I said, look, we need to build a computer cluster to help us process some of our data. And, and his eyes went wide, his eyes lit up. And he said, you know, it's always been my dream to build my own cluster. And I said, look, the job is yours if you want it. He took that job, he took ownership of that project and he ran with it. He built the cluster, he named the cluster, he designed the cluster. We supported him, but I empower my students to take possession of their projects. He uh, was successful with the cluster, incredible contribution to our work, an enormous amount of discoveries and data was processed on that cluster. But I wanna focus on what happened after he graduated. He went to apply for a tech job in the city he said that when he went in for that interview, it was a technology company, all they asked him about was the astronomy. He said they told me they'd never seen anything like that on someone's resume, and all they wanted to hear about was the telescope and how it works and all these other sort of things, and he got the job. Right now, he, he was a real success at that company, but he moved on. He, he works at Google, and he has an extremely successful career, and I'm incredibly proud of him. But it goes to show those experiences, those close interactions that you can have here at SUNY Old Westbury enable you and allow you to reach and achieve your goals that you have for yourselves. They unlock those doors. I want to address another issue that I think you saw with the panel, and this is so important. We are designed to help you reach the aspirations that you have, but you need to be aware that sometimes those aspirations change job markets change, society changes. You need to know that if you come here to SUNY Old Westbury, you're gonna get an education which is broad-based. We're going to turn you into a formidable individual who's intelligent and can reason, express themselves well, think clearly. So when plans change, or if your aspirations change, or if society changes, you are gonna be adept and able to negotiate and navigate all of those changes and the, the different environments that life is gonna present you.
So although you may have a particular goal in mind right now, getting that broad-based education is the key to security and being able to, to access the future, which is, if you listen to the students of the uh, stories, can take you to a very different place than you might have imagined. I want to close by talking to you a little bit about your future. I know uh, a good bit about science and technology, so some of these are going to focus on that, but I want to give you an image of the world that's going to be created for you in your lifetime. In your lifetime, you will see the development of a fusion reactor. And along with the development of fuel cell technology and um, solar cell technology, as a society, we are going to gain access to abundant sources of energy that do not harm the environment. In your lifetime, there are going to be medical treatments that are designed and implemented at the level of your DNA. And they're going to create a new kind of medical treatment that will create cures, the likes of which we've never seen. In your lifetime, you will have the ability, and it will be more commonplace than you think, to travel to space. You will have the ability, if you want, believe it or not, within your lifetime to set foot on the moon. So for your generation, not even the sky is the limit. That bright future that I just described is not gonna happen overnight. And it's not gonna happen on its own. It's gonna take an enormous number of bright and energetic minds to help make it happen. In other words, it's going to take all of you. And the thing that I want you to take away from today is the understanding that your ability to reach out and grab that future, to begin that journey, to own that future, can start right here at SUNY Old Westbury. Thank you.